Uh huh. Yeah, my end it is. As far as we can tell. So, um, as I told another people contact me, I said, if you, you know, no need to get out, stay home, watch online. So that's what we're trying to do this morning. Uh, I guess. There we go. Ah, uh, turn it on, it helps. Technology is great when it works. <laughs> anyway, any prayer requests this morning? I, I appreciate you all being here. I uh, do want you to drive safely home once we depart. We'll probably cut down some of the hymn singing. I don't see this being a great singing crowd. <laughs> I see some great voices here. Well, I see a few. I didn't say this. <laughs> uh, any prayer requests this morning? Go on. Just, just dad got discharged from the hospital this past week. He's doing really well. He's doing well. Good to hear. Glad to hear your dad's doing well, Joe. All right, anything else this morning? Uh, keep the, yeah, keep the homeless in our prayers. Uh, I think there have been a few people who've died because of the cold weather, hypothermia and all that, so let's remember that. So, all right, with that said. I did forget one thing. Let me do one thing real quick because I have something at the end of the service to do with if I, Symbolic as it is, at the end of the service, we will be removing the Hallelujah banner from our sanctuary as we go into the Lenten season. So, again, as we gather, the season of Epiphany is ending and the time of Lent is beginning. This transition is marked in our readings by biblical passages that reflect a type of changeover. In our Old Testament reading, we observe the prophetic, prophetic mat mantle being passed from Elijah to Elisha. In the epistle lesson, the Apostle Paul details the fading glory of the Old Covenant being replaced by the eternal glory of the New Covenant. And of course, our Gospel lesson identifies this transition with the transfiguration in the life of our Lord, when the Kingdom of God is revealed and Christ's eternal radiance is displayed. Let's stand as we sing together. This is in our, this is in our songbook, sometimes Alleluia, as we come together.
ourselves and the truth is not in us. But, but if, if we, we confess, confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. O God, our Father, we admit and confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. We confess that we have not always brought glory to you through our words and our deeds. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. We repent of all that is sinful in our lives, both that which we know and those things unknown to us that are against your righteous laws. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. Upon this, your confession, and by the command of our Lord, I, a called ordained servant sort of Christ, forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. And to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning. Is now and will be forever. Amen. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, for, uh, for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Save, comfort, defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn of praise. God is so good.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirm the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadow our adoption by grace, mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory, and bring us in the fullness of our inheritance in heaven, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading. The Old Testament reading for the Transfiguration of Our Lord Sunday is from the second chapter of 2 Kings. Two of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament are Elijah and Elisha. These two not only proclaimed God's message, pointing out sin and calling for repentance, but they also performed a number of miracles. Elijah has been informed that his time of departure is near. Knowing that his time is close at hand, he tests the faithfulness of, Eli of Elisha, Elisha. Elisha demonstrates his perseverance. Elijah then asks Elisha uh, what Elisha would like. Elisha asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, which is a request to be his right, rightly successor and Israel's premier prophet. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And it came about, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up by a whirlwind to heaven, that Elisha went with Elijah, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? He said, Yes, I know. Be still. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be still. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now fifty men of the sons of the prophet went and stood opposite them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, and folded it, folded it together, and struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. So as, as they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in the gradual. Praise, Praise the Lord, Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. The Epistle reading. The epistle reading is from the third and fourth chapters of 2 Corinthians. 
the Apostle Paul reveals a secret from the Old Testament. Whenever Moses was in God's presence, his appearance would be transfigured. In other words, Moses' face shone with the glory of the Lord. Moses indicated that he put on a veil so that the people would not be frightened. Paul says that Moses put on the veil so that the people would not see that the glory faded. The old covenant came in glory. Excuse me. <laughs> came in glory. Uh, <clears throat> but a glory that would not last. The new covenant comes in an unfading glory because it causes an inward transformation. Paul preached with boldness a gospel that changed darkness into light. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 6. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lays over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart, but we renounce the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the Word of God, but, it, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I'm trying to read from my iPad, and it's not functioning with me. Connection was lost. I'll go back to the paper copy. What else, right? <laughs> what else? Uh, where were we? Verse 4, chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, but we, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the Word of God, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand and join with me in the verse before the gospel. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Gospel reading. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Saint, Saint Mark, the ninth chapter, verses 2 through 9. Glory to you, Lord. amazing sight it must have been, and what an incredible privilege to be given. After Jesus had promised that some of those with him would see the kingdom of God, he took Peter, John, and James up a mountain. There, three remarkable events transpired. First, Jesus was transfigured. Some of his eternal glory was revealed. Second, he had a meeting with Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. Third, a voice out of heaven confirmed that Jesus is God's own Son and that he should be obeyed. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant, exceedingly white, 
as no law on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. All at once, they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you may see it for the hymn of the day. The Lord, my God, be praised. Exodus today. What is 
his name? This is the question that Moses asks of God. Uh, that should be, boy, that's, boy, did I type that wrong. Exodus 13. <laughs> uh, that's Exodus 3. Can I proofread these things? <laughs> Okay, that's just this, uh, the snow, everything else. Exodus 3, 1 through 14. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Hobrit, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked. And behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near here. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He also said, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from a land, from that land to a, to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Amorite, and the Pesavite, and the Hevite, and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly. I'll be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. You're probably well familiar with this event in the life of Moses. The burning bush It's one of those things that we talk about with young kids and grow up. Such a fascinating event. A bush that's burning but not being consumed and God calling to Moses from it. And God assigning him a task. It's Moses who will go back and rescue God's people from Egypt. But as we think of this, what is his name? We, we should ask, why would Moses ask for a name? Why would Moses want the name? God's already said, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Why would Moses ask for a name? Well, consider a few things. First of all, it was Moses that we attribute to writing the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if he's the one who wrote them, we're not sure, we can't be quite sure what Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his sons, how they referred to God. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not questioning the inspiration of the Bible or any of that, but did they use the name Yahweh? Did they use the name Elohim? Did they use those names that See, now Moses is getting from God. We don't know much about their worship practices in some way. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We know a little. But it wasn't until Moses receives the law in the wilderness that a pattern of worship is established for the Israelites. We don't know what it was like. So when they, when they venture into Egypt, when God prepares for them, Joseph being sent ahead, becoming a second to Pharaoh in the land, and they go down there because of the famine, we don't know what worship practices they took on. We don't know how they conduct. They stayed separate from the Egyptians, but they became slaves or servants. And it 
It was a 400 year period, they were down there. They, they multiplied, they grew, they became prosperous, they were oppressed. And now, did they remember the name? Did they remember who God was? Did they remember the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You know, they seem, God seems to imply to Moses, they'll remember who I am. But they also were in a land and a culture where there were many names for various gods, different aspects for God. The Egyptians had a pantheon, a, a number of gods. That's how Moses grew up. Moses grew up in Pharaoh's household. He was educated in the Egyptian way. He knew all the names of their gods. So he's saying, now, wait a minute. What's your name? I mean, I know the name of all these other gods. How, who am I supposed to say sent me to you? If they look at me and say, what, what's God's name? What am I supposed to say? That's one of the reasons Moses is saying, how am I to clarify with your children who I am and who you are because... They've rejected me a little. They, they know me as, as an Egyptian more than as an Israelite. Well, that's the first reason that Moses wanted to be able to identify himself with the children of Israel. But to, have, to know a name back then <coughs> was more than just knowing a name today. To know a name back then, it denotes relationship. If Moses had the name of God, it indicated he was in a relationship with that God. But more often than that, it also implies authority. When Moses could come in the name of God, it meant that he had authority to speak for that God. So this is what Moses said, I'm coming to the children of Israel, okay? I'm coming, I'm going to say to them what? What am I going to tell about your name? Your name means I'm in a relationship with you. Your name, I can speak it, means I have the authority from you. So what do we say about this name that Moses was given? The name, first of all, expresses the nature of God. I am who I am, or I am. This, this name expresses the very nature of God. It talks about him being self-existent. God is self-existent. I am. What do you want, Moses? I, I am. I have been here, uh, I, you know, I, I'm always here, I've always existed, I'm self-existent, therefore I'm eternal. This, is, this name indicates his very nature, his self-existence, his eternal, eternality, the fact that he is uncaused. You know, everything has a cause except God. God is the cause of all things. He's unconditioned. He's the one who was the supreme creator, the one who did everything else. Nobody conditioned him in any way, shape, or form. He was independent. I am who I am. I have no one to answer to. I answer only to myself. Uh, and he was self-sufficient. He didn't need anybody else. God was always sufficient. Himself. So the name that God gives to Moses, I am, or I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. There are a number of different translations given, given to this expression that, that God gave to Moses. This Yahweh, I am who I am, indicates everything about the nature of God, or gives us all these insights into his nature. Self-sufficiency, self-existence, eternality, all those things. So that's what he's telling Moses, you know, I am. That's it, Moses. I can't define myself any other way. But the name also expresses the character of God. The name expresses the nature of God. It expresses the character of God. By that, it means that we have a God of salvation. Moses, you're going to bring my people out of Egypt. I'm going to redeem them from their slavery. I'm going to set them free. This is a God of salvation who brings redemption to his people. We know it clearly in the Old, in the New Testament. I mean, the Old Testament example of God releasing his people from slavery in Egypt into the Promised Land is a great picture of the salvation he gives to us through the cross of Christ as he redeems us from our sins, sets us free from the slavery of sin, and promises us a new land, a heavenly land, a heavenly home with him forevermore. So the name expresses that God is a God of salvation. It also is a God of compassion. 
He said, I've heard the groans of my people. I've heard their suffering. I've heard their sorrow. I am here because I care about them. I'm going to rescue and redeem them. So the name is the God of salvation. It's the God of compassion. And finally, it's the God of faithfulness. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I'm the God who promised them a, a new land, and I'm the God who fulfills that promise. I am the faithful God who, who has always been with my people, and now I'm redeeming them from the horrible situation they're in and giving them a new life and a new place. <clears throat> and that's exactly what God does for us through the cross of Christ. To know the name of God is to know the name of Christ. As Paul writes in Philippians, there is no greater name by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus, the God of gods. This is it. So Moses was saying, who are you? And we ask the same question yet today. Who is God? He is the God who provides us with salvation. He is the God whose compassion toward us as people, showing us his love, his grace, his mercy. And he is the God who is faithful to his promises. When God makes a promise to you, it is sure, it is certain. This is the God, eternal, self-sufficient, uncaused, self-existent, who will always be there for us as people, just as he was there for Moses and the children of Israel long ago. This is the God. What is his name? His character and his nature expressed in that simple phrase, I am. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the Father of the Spirit be with you all. As always, offerings go in the baptismal font. Thank you for those who have given. Let us stand. Let us confess our common faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified close before us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge the one after the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Each petition of this morning's prayers conclude, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you revealed your glory in the transfiguration of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who tabernacled among us in the flesh. Open our eyes of faith, that we would see him continuing to tabernacle among us here in the divine service, and that we would heed your admonition to listen to him as he forgives and preserves us at the font, pulpit, and altar. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Father, at the appearance of Moses and Elijah at our Lord's glorious transfiguration, you revealed to us that all the law and the prophets are fulfilled in him. Send your blessing upon all pastors and servants of your church, that all their preaching and teaching would flow from the right understanding, that all Holy Scripture testifies of Christ, and all that he has done and continues to do for our eternal salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Father, from whom every fatherhood under heaven is named, support and bless every Christian home, that husbands and wives should be devoted to one another, and parents would pass on the faith to their children by word and deed. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 
Almighty Father. You alone establish all authority on earth. Bless those entrusted with th this responsibility both here and abroad, that they would serve with integrity and honor for the well-being of all. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Merciful Father, graciously comfort and strengthen those who are sick, hospitalized, or enduring ongoing treatment, that they would know your peace and receive healing and relief according to your gracious will. Be with those who are lonely, depressed, or mentally ill. Surround them with those who know your redeeming love and will mercifully care for them. Grant steadfastness to those in your death, comfort to those who grieve, and the sure and certain hope of all your children. Be especially with those during this cold weather who are homeless and those who are living on the streets. Watch over and protect them and give them warm shelter, we pray. This morning we think especially of Lee Romine as he's continuing to go through surgery. We ask your help on his behalf. We rejoice and give you praise and thanks for being with Joe Sanders' father that he is home and doing well. We continue to pray for Renee's nephew, Sean, uh, as he is recovering from a possible heart attack, be with him. Continue with the family, relatives, and friends of Wayne Grant, Tina Brewer's uh, cousin. Uh, as they mourn his passing, may you give them strength and hope. Be with Ron Dottillo as he's having heart issues. Keep your hand upon him. Uh, be with all of those in our congregation who are home, homebound, uh, especially those who've had some reactions to the uh, vaccine for the uh, coronavirus. Keep them in your care. Continue to be with Deborah Payne as she's undergoing chemotherapy. Help her each and every day. Be with her. Be with Renee as she's having shoulder and hip pain. Watch over her. Continue to be with all the health care workers, keeping them safe in all that they do. Be with Don Sanders, Kim Phillips, Taylor Phillips, Sherry Davidson, April Spray, and Mark Clark. We ask your blessing upon them. May you keep them from being infected or contagious and watch over and guide them. And be with all hospital chaplains at DeSoto Baptist and other hospitals as they work to comfort those who are grieving, those who are, are suffering. Give them wisdom, give them strength, help them in all things. In all these things, Lord, be with those in our hearts and our mind. Lord, in your mercy. In our prayers. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember on this day the glorious manifestation of your Son's divinity on the Mount of Transfiguration. Teach us to listen to Jesus and ever fix our eyes on him and his innocent suffering and death for our forgiveness. By your grace and mercy, strengthen us to remain faithful in all circumstances of trial, temptation, and persecution. Preserve us to, to the end, that we may die a blessed death believing in your beloved Son, with whom you are well pleased. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and all God's people said, Amen. Let us join our hearts and our voices in the prayer our Savior taught us to pray, saying, Our, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If our head elder would come forward at this time, Tom, up front, sir. Sorry. Grab the banner, please. Hold it for the congregation to see. This week, with Ash Wednesday, we begin our observance of Lent to highlight this penitential nature of the season. It is the church's custom to suspend the use of the word Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. A tradition has been in place since the 5th century not to use the joyful word Hallelujah in worship from the conclusion of worship on the final Sunday before Lent, which is today, until the first service on Easter Sunday. Our head elder will now remove Alleluia from our sanctuary. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, grace unto you. The Lord lift up his counsel upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for a few announcements. Uh, thank you to Jacob and those who attended that prayer time. 
Uh, I'm kind of sorry I wasn't there, but you can't just plug in the internet anymore. We're still working on that. But thank, thankfully, Mike, Mike Smith back there has a hot spot on his phone, and we're using that this morning. Uh, I don't think we're going to be live <laughs> on Wednesday night. I kind of doubt it. I'll keep you posted. Watch the emails, watch the Facebook, all that. Uh, we will have a service, uh, but it's kind of hard to do imposition of ashes on the internet. <laughs> so, but we will have a service Wednesday night. If it isn't here, it'll be live streamed from my house. And with the snow that's coming, we'll see. I can't guarantee anything, but we'll see. Hopefully next Sunday we'll come back together for prayer time, etc. Then our midweek Lenten services continue as the weather clears on the 28th. No birthdays or anniversaries that I'm aware of. Anybody have any birthdays or anniversaries? Let's stand for our closing hymn. Lead on, O King Eternal. Remember the baby bottles. What? Remember the baby bottles. The baby bottles. Remember the baby bottles. Yes, first Sunday in March. Remember the baby bottles. Thank you.